Howdy, this is Taylor Marshall. Thanks for listening to the show. This week is going to be a little bit different. I'm taking a break from the Book of Revelation series. We've been going through every single verse, line by line, chapter by chapter in the Book of Revelation. But this week I'm going to share with you a sample from the Ox Talk podcast. As some of you may know, I do two podcasts. I do the Taylor Marshall Catholic Show. It's the one you're listening to right now. And then I do a special podcast called the Ox Talk. It's named after St. Thomas Aquinas, who's was called the Dumb Ox because he was so large and also so quiet, but incredibly intelligent. And this is a podcast that's a bit more theological, and it's for members of the new St. Thomas Institute. And I know many of you that listen to this podcast, The Taylor Marshall Show, are members of the new St. Thomas Institute. For those of you that aren't, I wanted to give you this uh, sample of what the Ox Talk is like. Uh, in this Ox Talk, we go over the harrowing of hell, questions about Christ descending into the limbo of the fathers and how all that works from the Catholic point of view. We also talk about whether or not the existence of God is self-evident to infants, to children, to babies. And then we also talk about the controversial teaching of sede vacantism, which is an error that some Catholics believe in, that, that is that there was no pope or has been no pope since 1958, since St. John the 23rd. Of course, it's an error. And we explain what it is, and then a variation on it called sede privationism, uh, brought up by one of our members in the New St. Thomas Institute. So I think you can see already that um, we are delving into some high-level topics there, and I just wanted to give you a sample of it. We have fall enrollment for the New St. Thomas Institute open. We have a few more spots left, and we are closing it down next week. So there's also um, a sale on tuition. I think it's 37% off or something like that. So if you want to join the New St. Thomas Institute, you'll get uh, tons of videos on Christology, Mariology, sacramental theology, Eucharistic theology, um, liturgical things. Also, we're doing an entire certificate now on a Catholic apologetics. So how to share Catholic faith with Jewish friends, with Muslims, with Jehovah's Witnesses, with Mormons, and then also how do you defend all these controversial teachings of the Catholic Church, topics relating to homosexuality, abortion, contraception. So what we do in the New St. Thomas Institute is we give you video resources and audio resources, just like the one you're listening to now, that take you step by step through these issues so that you have the knowledge and the confidence to represent and defend the Catholic faith. So if you're interested in that, please head over to newstthomas.com, newstthomas.com. You can look at some sample videos and look at how the Institute works. And if you think it's going to be helpful to you, please sign up as we will be closing down enrollment next week. And now we're going to get into this Ox Talk. Again, it's on the harrowing of hell. Is the existence of God self-evident, especially to infants? And then some questions about radical traditionalism and set of a contest. All right, well, hope you enjoy. God bless. You're listening to Ox Talk Radio, the official podcast of the new St. Thomas Institute. And today we're going to look at not just one question from you, the mighty, mighty musk oxen, but three questions. We're going to look at the harrowing of hell and some questions about that. We're going to look at whether or not the existence of God is self-evident for babies, a question from one of our members named Margie, and also a recent question and comment from Daniel about the Society of St. Pius X as it relates to our recent video lesson on Sede Vicantism, the teaching that there haven't been any popes since 1958. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, well, welcome back. Mighty, mighty musk oxen. I've really enjoyed reading all your comments over the past week, and I've gone in there and I've answered them all and been engaging with you. Thank you so much for all your great feedback as well. Uh, just a couple announcements. We now have the quiz up for the module on how to answer Protestantism. So if you finish those video lessons, head over there, take the quiz, see how you did. And then we've also put up the quiz for how to answer Catholics who leave the church. All of us know people who were Catholic and they've since stopped practicing or they've formally left the Catholic Church. We have a whole series of video lessons there that have come up over the last two months, and the quiz uh, went up 
earlier today. So if you haven't taken your quizzes yet for either of these while you're listening to this Ox Talk, head on over to NewStThomas.com, log in, and uh, take the quizzes if you've already finished those video lessons. If you haven't finished the video lessons, well, man, what are you waiting for? Get on to it. Those two modules are awesome. Um, one of them is how to answer Protestants. So we look at, you know, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Scripture alone, faith alone, how to explain the papacy to Protestants. Um, we do a whole history timeline of the Protestant Reformation. Lots of good videos there. So make sure you check those out. And then also the module on how to help people who have left the church. I mean, we look at things like liturgical abuse. We look at cafeteria Catholics. We look at priestly sexual scandals. How do you answer people when they bring these things up? They throw this kind of garbage in your face. How do we, as Catholics who love Christ and love Mary and love the church and love our priesthood, how do we make a defense or an account? And should we apologize? What shouldn't we apologize for? And how do we handle liturgical abuse? All of this stuff is in the most recent module on the Certificate for Catholic Apologetics. So if you have access to that certificate, head on over there and uh, start watching or listening to those video lessons. They're really good, and we're getting some really great feedback. Well, one of our most recent uh, video lessons in that module was on, well, you know, we talked about cafeteria Catholics, but on the other end of the spectrum, the opposite polarity are really radical traditionalist Catholics who, for example, reject the current papacy. They reject not only the current papacy, they reject the papacy of men like St. John Paul II and St. John the Twenty Third, And they reject Vatican II as not only not an ecumenical council, but as a heretical and evil council. So how do we answer those types of people? Well, we have some great questions this week. Like I said in the intro, we have three questions. One of them is related to the Sede Vacante issue, and it comes from one of our members named Daniel. He asked that we would do an entire podcast on Sede Vacantism, and we're not going to do an entire podcast on it, but we are going to spend a lot of time on it. We also have a question from Chelsea about Christ descending into hell, always a popular topic in the New St. Thomas Institute. Catholics are, I don't know, they're just there's so many questions about Christ descending into hell. I think it's because primarily it's not a doctrine that Protestants believe in or they reject, and so Catholics often find themselves in conflict with Protestants. I think that might be part of it. And also, you know, we we think of Christ as holy and pure and immaculate and without any sin. And so why would he descend into hell? So it's something that kind of concerns us and makes us wrinkle up our brow. So we're going to answer that question today by from Chelsea B. And then we have a member named Margie, and she has a question about um, whether or not God's existence is self-evident because we have a lesson on atheism that, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, teaches that the existence of God is evident, and there's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. But Thomas Aquinas says that the existence of God is not, quote, self-evident. And so Margie has some questions, you know, about, well, what about mentally challenged toddlers? Um, What about babies? Um, What about, you know, unbelievers of small children? How does this relate to their understanding about the existence of God? And could it be that maybe they are in some way pre-wired or hardwired to have a belief in God? And does that mean that they come born with a belief in God? Of course, Thomas Aquinas is going to say no on that one. We're going to look at all those issues as well. So I think you can see today's Ox Talk is jammed, packed. And I'm going to begin out of the gate with this topic of Sede Vacantism. I'm, I don't want to spend too much time on today's Ox Talk on this because we did an entire video lesson on it in the New St. Thomas Institute. So if you're interested in this topic and you want to know, well, what, what is what is Taylor talking about? There's Catholics out there that don't believe in the Pope? Well, yes, they're called Sede Vacantis, and we look at why they believe that, and then we look at the arguments that they use to affirm their belief in that, and then we show how you can use as a Catholic, a faithful Catholic, you can use papal teaching, magisterial documents, even before Vatican II ever happened, to show that the Sede Vacantis position is false. It is heretical. And we, in the video lesson, show that primarily you're going to look at Vatican I to affirm this orthodox position. But Daniel has this comment and this question. I'm going to read the whole one. 
Daniel, member of New St. Thomas Institute. Thanks, Daniel, for this comment. He writes this, quote, Dr. Marshall, I would love to hear a whole podcast devoted to this topic. It would be especially interesting to hear your thoughts on sede privationism and its relationship to things like the SSPX, Society of St. Pius X. In my uneducated opinion, sede privationism might be a sort of unconscious default position in much of the ultra-traditionalist movement, end quote. So, Daniel, great question and comment there. Um, he assumes what sede vacantism is, but then he brings up this new term, sede privationism. Sede privationism. Now, I wrote an article about this many years ago um, called, Is Mel Gibson a sede privationist? Oh, or is Mel Gibson a sede vacantist? And we all know Mel Gibson, you know, from Mad Max and Lethal Weapon and Hamlet. But we Catholics really respect him for his movie, The Passion of the Christ, which moved all of us, I think, brought a lot of people to know Christ, a lot of people to even become Catholic. It exposed a lot of Protestants to the role of Mary in The Passion and at the cross of Christ. So it's a beautiful movie, and I love that movie. And as you know, sometimes you'll see clips, you know, of it all over the place, including you know NSTI and Catholic TV and YouTube and everywhere. Everyone knows that movie. But Mel Gibson is a rather traditionalist type Catholic, and we know that his father pretty much rejects the papacy. He goes to a independent chapel in Houston, Texas, where there are people who reject the current pope and reject Vatican II. And it seems that Mel Gibson is, you know, so conservative that he also um, rejects, well, at least he rejected Benedict XVI. I imagine he rejects Pope Francis. Um, but he's not fully sede vacantis. He seems to hold to this position of sede privationist. So what is this term, sede privationist? Well, it was a term invented by a, Brit a British traditionalist theologian named William Morgan. And he is really just lifting um, a theological position by a French Dominican named Michel-Louis Guerra de Lorient. I hope I said that right. came out pretty good, I think. And Laurier, he states that a man can be pope materially, but not formally. So, as you know, in New St. Thomas Institute, we've learned the between form and matter. And here, Laurier is using this distinction with regard to the papacy, something I don't think that's ever really been done. And so, according to his thesis, which is the sede privationist thesis, and you can see the the term sede means seat or chair, the chair of Peter. Privation. Privation means something is deprived, something is lacking. So according to this position of Laurier's, there is a pope, but he's only the pope materially. He's not the pope formally. So by matter, he's the pope, but by form, he is not the pope. So he's saying there is no vacant seat. There is no lack of pope. There is a real pope, a bishop of Rome right now. But according to him and others, since he is a heretic, and he would, they would put John the 23rd this way, Paul the 6th, John Paul 1, John Paul 2 a heretic, Benny the 16th a heretic, Francis the heretic, I guess anyone else is going to come, heretic. Since they're heretics, they don't lose their papacy, but they lose the formality of, of their papacy. Now, why would they hold to something like this? Well, it's kind of convenient because as you can see in our video lesson, our New St. Thomas Institute lesson on sede vacantism, it's really ridiculous to believe, to be Catholic and believe that there is no longer a pope. There's a lot of problems with this. First of all, it, there's Catholic documents that we show in that video lesson that directly deny that such could be the case. Also, we know that popes are elected by cardinals. Well, if John the Twenty Third wasn't a pope, that means he couldn't appoint any cardinals. And if Paul the Sixth was was not a pope, he couldn't appoint any cardinals. And if John Paul the First wasn't the pope, he couldn't appoint any cardinals. And so that means there are no cardinals around right now. And if there are no cardinals, that means there can't be a valid election of the pope, which means never again in human 
history in the future will there ever be a pope again. That's just ridiculous. It's folly. So what some of these savvy, smart traditionalists, and by traditionalists here, I, I, I got to be very careful. I just want to go on the record and say, you know, I attend the Latin Mass. I am traditional in that way. Yesterday, I went to the Catholic Mass according to the 1962 Missal. I also go to the Novus Ordo. So I understand that being traditional is no crime. It's a good thing. We Catholics follow sacred tradition. But when I'm using the word traditionalist and I'm putting all this emphasis on the ist, I'm really referring to those radical traditionalists who reject the council and reject the popes. So what some of these radical groups have done is, is they've realized that being sede vacante is, is a position that's irrational and contrary to Catholic teaching. And so some of them have sort of drifted into this sede privationist position, and I think Mel Gibson has as well. You can go to taylormarshall.com, my personal site, and search for is Mel Gibson a sede vacante, and you can see my reasoning there for, for why I think that's the case. But the sede privationist is saying there are popes, there are popes materially, but not formally, and according to our our radical French Dominican Lauriers, he's saying that if any of these popes would recant of their heresy, boom, they would immediately become formally pope and materially pope and full out papal. Now, what exactly does this mean? Well, if you read through the lines, what it means is is these radical traditionalist groups and theologians can acknowledge that there is a pope, a valid pope right now, but that he's not formally a pope, so therefore they don't have to obey him, listen to him. They can set up their own seminaries. They can consecrate their own bishops. They can do whatever they want in canon law because the pope formally does not have authority. Now, Daniel has an interesting comment here, and this is why I want to take his question and bring it into the Ox Talk. Daniel's question is about the Society of St. Pius X, and maybe that they and others have a default sede privationist belief. Now, the Society of St. Pius X was started by Archbishop Lefebvre, who was a conservative um, leader uh, during the Second Vatican Council. He was a missionary. He did many heroic things for the faith. I've met people who have known him, and they've had some nice things to say about him. But he defied... Pope John Paul II by consecrating bishops without a papal mandate. And because of this, he received excommunication from the Holy See, from St. John Paul II. And he died under excommunication. And he had started a society called the Society of St. Pius X. And it was originally begun because seminarians wanted to be able to receive the minor orders. And if you've watched our NSTI video on Thomas Aquinas and Holy Orders, we go through the minor orders there, but they want to receive the minor orders, and these minor orders had been abrogated um, previously, and so they were looking for a bishop who would give them these minor orders, which is the traditional way that the church has been ordaining seminarians and priests for at least 1,500 years. And it developed into a priestly society of men who wanted to fo follow the older books, the older liturgy, primarily the liturgy of 19. 62, uh, the liturgy at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council before all the liturgical changes. And of course, many people have been scandalized by abuses in the liturgy and have therefore retreated to the old liturgical books. And the Society of St. Pius X was the leader in this movement, and they did a lot of good things, but they also did some bad things. You know, you can't consecrate bishops without papal mandate. And so since that time period, since the excommunication excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre, the Society of St. Pius X has, there's been attempts to bring them back into full communion with the Church, and, you know, Pope Bennett XVI really, I think, came close and tried, um, and his issuing of Sumorum Pontificum and all sorts of gestures really showed that Pope Benedict was trying to reconcile the Society of St. Pius X, but they would not come back into full communion. And they, as, as of the recording of this podcast, they are still not in full communion with the Pope, which means their bishops are not in communion with the current Holy Father. This is a big problem, 
But the, the Society of St. Pius X are not sede vacantis. They believe that the popes are truly popes. But here's the problem. They say that on paper, but when it comes to pastoral practice and when it comes to canon law, they behave like sede privationists. Here's what I mean. The Society of St. Pius X, there are, they claim that they, their superior, can remit sins that are, res- that are reserved to the Holy See. There are certain sins that, if they're confessed in the confessional, have to be referred upward to the Pope himself. For example, desecrating the Eucharist, or if a priest solicits sex in the confessional, that sin is reserved to the Holy See. It goes to the Holy Father. He can't just go to a normal confession and receive absolution. These are super serious sins. So if you desecrated the Eucharist in like a, um, a witchcraft ceremony and you confess that, the, that case is going to go all the way to Rome, all the way to the Pope. And of course, these sins happen from time to time, and they go to the Holy See. These sins even happen in the circles of Saint, the Society of St. Pius X. And the Society of St. Pius X believes that they can remit sins that are reserved to the Holy Father. What this essentially means is the Society of St. Pius X believes they have papal power. It also shows that they are reluctant to fully recognize the Pope. So they are granting that he is materially the Pope, but not formally the Pope. Also, the very fact that they received consecration as bishops, Episcopal consecrations, and would consider doing it yet again without papal mandate shows that while they acknowledge the Pope is materially the Pope, they formally do not recognize him. And they don't recognize the excommunications. They never have. And they don't recognize the excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre. So I think Daniel's on at something. I Honestly, Daniel have never actually thought of the SSPX as said a privationist. I've always just thought of them as a schismatic traditional group. But I think when it comes to canon law and pastoral practice, they are, they're not out, outright said a privationist, but some of their practices and some of the way that they, the ways that they speak does seem to indicate that while they reluctantly grant that the Pope is the Pope, they don't want to formally recognize his power and jurisdiction over them, especially their bishops. And that's a big problem. So, Daniel, good point. My gut, and I, of course, would be willing to be corrected by anyone who has something more to say about this in the comments inside New St. Thomas Institute. My gut is, yeah, I think groups like the SSPX um, or even some traditionalists um, in other places have a de facto set a privationist viewpoint. I think there's a website, and I'm not endorsing this, and I don't want people to go and read it and become fans on, but there's a website called Tradition in Action. And on this website, Tradition in Action, they seem to speak of the Pope, for example, Pope Francis, as a Pope, but they don't recognize him as formally the Pope. So they seem to be set a privationist. For example, they'll say stuff like Pope Bergoglio instead of Pope Francis. So they seem to be recognizing him as a Pope but they also seem to not be recognizing him, and it seems to be this sedi privationist viewpoint. By the way, in conclusion on this one point, on sedi privationism, uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit forced, don't you think? I mean, the Pope is the Pope materially, but not formally. Um, there's some bad philosophy going on there. I mean. A pope is one who is materially pope and formally the pope. I mean, the form of the pope would speak of his essence. And if you said, well, he's not formally the pope, he doesn't have the essence of the papacy, well, then he's not really the pope. So you can't really have your cake and eat it too on this. I I think it is a little bit more sophisticated, but I still think ultimately this position fails because you you either have the form of papacy, the Petrine ministry, or you do not. And if you do not have the form of the Petrine ministry, you are not Pope. So I can appreciate that they're trying to parse out the papacy here, but I think ultimately 
Sedai privationism, just like Sedai vacantism, fails. So, Daniel, thanks for that. And I, I, I want to keep talking about this. If you have thoughts about this, uh, go on into this, this video lesson. It's in the module on when Catholics leave the church, because Catholics leave the church to become radical traditionalist types, just like we're talking about here, ultra traditionalist, as Daniel talks about them. Go into that lesson and leave a comment. Guaranteed, I'll be there. I'll respond to it. I want to dialogue with y'all on this point, because it is uh, very interesting to me, especially as someone who, you know, I do have a, a love and appreciation for traditional forms of liturgy, though honestly, and I'll just be very blunt and honest with you, I have very little patience with the angry, mean, radical, ultra-traditionalist um, right in the church. I think that there's a lot of lack of charity. I think there's a lot of even heresy and even some Gnosticism in these groups um, who seek to separate themselves and live in a sort of puritanical alternate church. I think that's just really wrong, and, and we shouldn't uh, shouldn't be like that at all as Catholics. But I think as Catholics, we should appreciate and love sacred music, Gregorian chant, um, traditional liturgy, beauty, uh, beautiful vestments, reverence towards the Eucharist, well-trained altar boys, et cetera, and so on. And I think most of y'all all agree with that anyway. Okay, so let's move on to this question submitted by our member and friend here, Chelsea. Chelsea watched the He Descended Into Hell Why video unit that's in our curriculum for the Certificate in Catholic Theology. And she writes this question, quote, I'm very confused on why all this is necessary if God and Christ's salvation are outside of time, end quote. So Chelsea, thanks so much for this, this question. Uh, Chelsea is, of course, referring to the harrowing of hell. That's what we talk about in that video lesson. You know, the Apostles' Creed says that Christ descended into hell. Why did he descend into hell? He had no sin. He didn't go to suffer. Um, he had already won salvation at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. Why would we say that Christ descended into hell? Well, it goes back to this doctrine, the harrowing of hell, which we talk about in depth in this video lesson. So if you haven't watched this video lesson, you're missing out. Go see it. It's a great one. Uh, we go through all the scripture. We go through church fathers. Just briefly, though, um, you know, we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, St. Paul says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he, des when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. That's quoting the Psalms, by the way. And then St. Paul says, what does it mean that he ascended except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe, end quote. And of course, our first pope, St. Peter, says something very similar in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6, quote, For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit, end quote. So in both these verses, we see that Christ descended to the dead. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, it says that Jesus went and proclaimed to the imprisoned spirits, and the church fathers love to talk about this. And they point out that before Christ died on the cross at 3 p.m. on Good Friday, all the Old Testament righteous people, Abraham, Moses, Sarah, David, Esther, John the Baptist, all of them were held in the limbo of the fathers, in Latin limbus patrum, Limbus is Latin for the edge or for the hem, that they stayed in this paradise because they were on the edge of hell. They weren't in the deep hole, the pit of fire. They were out far on the edges, far out on the limbus, and there they were in a perfect natural happiness. They didn't see God. They weren't in heaven, but they were in a natural happiness with Adam and Eve and all the others. And then when Christ died on the cross, his body and his soul separated. By the way, the definition of death, human death, is when your soul separates from your body. We believe that Christ died on the cross. 
His body was on the cross. They took it down. They put it in the tomb. It rose on third on the third day, but his soul went somewhere. Now we Catholics don't believe that his soul went to heaven. You might think that. Now his soul did have the beatific vision, so in that sense, the soul was in heaven. But the soul descended into the realm of the dead. In Hebrew, this is called Sheol. Uh, in the Gospels, it's called Abraham's bosom. In Latin theology, it's called the limbus patrum, the limbo of the fathers. And this is taught by all the early fathers. I mean, we see this in Tertullian. St. Hippolytus talks about it. Origen refers to the uh, descent of Christ into hell. St. Ambrose, the man who baptized St. Augustine. Of course, St. Augustine himself talks about it. And we also know that many in the early church believed that Christ did not redeem Adam and Eve, that they were just screwed. They were damned. They, they brought us into original sin. They're going to be in hell forever. The Catholic Church and the early fathers always believed that Adam and Eve repented and that they would eventually be saved, and they were saved when Christ descended into hell. And this is why you'll see in so many icons and in murals in the Catholic Church, when you see Christ descending into hell, he's stepping on, he's kicking in, He's given a roundhouse kick to the gates of hell, and he's trampling over the gates of hell, and then he's reaching his hand out to Adam and Eve, who represent all of humanity, and he's saying, hey, let's get the heck out of here. Actually, we could actually say this in an appropriate way. Let's get the hell out of here. And he grabs him by the hand, and he leads Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Rachel and Leah and Jacob, and he leads all of them to the heavenly realms, and he gives them the beatific vision. Literally, he shares his own beatific vision with them. By the way, there's a a really interesting apocryphal book. Um, I don't endorse this as scripture. It's not the word of God. It's not inspired. But if you read the Acts of Pilate, A-C-T-S, Acts of Pilate, it's part of a Uh, apocryphal gospel called the Gospel of Nicodemus. Again, this is total apocryphal, not scripture, um, but it recounts a fictional retelling of what it would have been like for Christ when he descended into hell and met with all the Old Testament saints. And it's an interesting read. So if you're looking for something short and interesting, I would encourage you to read the Acts of Pilate. Um, because it gives you kind of a, kind of like Dante's Inferno. We know that Dante's Inferno is not a literal depiction of what hell is like and the seven circles of hell and so on, but it's an interesting read, and it, it kind of gives you some things to reflect on. Same thing with the Acts of Pilate. It gives you an apocryphal, fictionalized, um, almost like a novelette of what it could have been like when Christ descended and and John the Baptist was there, and Adam and Eve, and everybody, like a big family reunion when the Messiah shows up to all these Jewish believers waiting in the limbo of the Father. So, back to the question, back to the comment. Chelsea asked, why is all this necessary? I mean, what's the point? She says, you know, if God's and Christ's salvation are outside of time, why would, you know, if it's outside of time... Why would Adam and Eve and Abraham and all those people have to be waiting in some holding tank for hundreds of years, thousands of years, waiting for Christ to show up? It's all outside of time anyway. Why not just let these people into heaven and and not have them, you know, waiting it out, Actually, literally waiting in limbo? Well, it's a good question. Um, But it all pivots on our Catholic belief that salvation does not N-O-T does not happen outside of time. Salvation very much happens in time. We Catholic Christians really do believe that our eternal salvation was purchased at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. We also believe that Christ rose from the dead in history on Easter Sunday at a certain time. We believe that all of salvation happens in the context of millennia, within centuries, within decades, within years, within months, within weeks, within days, within hours, within minutes, within seconds. All redemptive activity happens for us in time. 
So Christ literally was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary on a certain day at a certain time. He was born miraculously from the Virgin's womb at a certain second on a certain day. We believe, this is why we say in the Creed, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. We believe that Christ was crucified not as an idea, not as a symbol, but he was crucified in history under a Roman ruler named Pontius Pilate. And we can use history to realize, yeah, that was a real time period when the Romans were overseeing and ruling over and dominating the Jewish people. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, literally died on a cross. So all of salvation happens in time, not only objectively through the life of Christ and the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, but in your own life. If you're listening to this, there was a year, a day, in a second at which you came into contact with God's divine grace. For most of you, it was on the day of your baptism. At that very second, when the priest or deacon or whoever poured water on your baby head and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, God reached down and you died and you rose again because you were united to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died and he rose again. In Romans chapter 6, we read that each one of us died and rose again in baptism because we are united to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that happened for you in time. You received grace and the Holy Trinity dwelled inside of you at a certain moment in your life. And every single time we receive the Eucharist, either daily or on Sunday, that happens in time. We have a mystical communion, a union with Jesus Christ in that historical moment. Same thing for your first communion. Your first communion was your first communion at that moment. We Catholics follow the Jews on this. We don't believe creation is evil. We don't believe time is evil. We believe that creation is good, and we believe that time is good. We believe our bodies are good. It was the Gnostics, the heretics in the early church, who believed that salvation was through the idea of Christ, and that salvation was not faith and works in the historic person of Jesus Christ, but that salvation was through the attainment of mystical secret knowledge relating to the idea of a cosmic Christ. That was the Gnostic version of Christianity that was condemned by the Catholic Church. Gnostics wanted to take everything spiritual away from physical matter and away from time and project it up into the to the realm of the forms, like Plato, as Plato explains in his book, The Timaeus, and also in The Republic. That's what the Gnostics want to do. And the Catholic Church says, no, 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 no. We follow the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. We believe in the resurrection of the body. We believe that Christ's body literally rose from the dead, and we believe that one day our bodies will rise from the dead. So all of these things happen in time. And this goes back to the question. Salvation happened at 3 p.m. on Good Friday, Literally, that's when salvation happened. It didn't happen outside of time. It happened in time. And therefore, the salvation of the Old Testament saints happened at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. They had to wait. This is the Catholic teaching. We believe in the sequence, or what theologians call redemptive history. The Old Testament saints are part of redemptive history, and they had to to wait. By the way, Thomas Aquinas says that Christ's descent into hell and his appearance to them in the limbo of the fathers, in Abraham's bosom, was for them the sacrament of baptism. So, you know, we are united to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ through baptism. Those who are waiting in limbo, their sacramental baptism was Christ descending to them. So they were united to the death and resurrection of Christ by his descent, you and I are united to Christ through baptism. So I want to thank you for this question. This is, this is a really good question because it highlights for us redemptive history. So Chelsea, thank you so much for, for helping us remember that all of these things actually do happen 
in time. God, you know, Chelsea's totally right. God is outside of time. Totally. But salvation happens in time. Our redemption happens in time. Okay, so now for our third point today, we look at this comment from Margie. And I I like this comment a lot. Uh, I'm going to read the whole thing so that you guys can hear what Margie's saying. And then we'll go through it line by line. So Margie says this, Upon completing this module, my thoughts keep returning to. So Margie's talking about her atheism module. And um, she quotes me here. I don't know if this is an exact quote from the video, but it's, it's basically the gist of what I said in the video. Quote, So we don't come hardwired believing in God. Rather, as we experience creation in current time, we come to see that there must be a creator, end quote. So that's the position of Thomas Aquinas. Of course, that's my position. I think that's the, posi- you know, that's the position of all of you. We don't come hardwired believing in God. You don't come out of your mother's womb with a faith in Jesus Christ. You don't. We also don't come out of the womb with faith in a creator, that there's a creator. Instead, Thomas Aquinas says, as we grow up and acquire sensory data through our five senses, we begin to see the world, and as Paul says in Romans 1, we perceive in the world that there must be someone who created this world, and that is God. We also see order and beauty in the world. So we see the Grand Canyon, we see the anatomy of the, of the eyeball, we see the formation of birds in flight, we learn about microbiology, we see the stars while we're out camping. And when we see all these things, we say, you know, there must be a watchmaker. There must be a designer who put order into all this world. It couldn't just be from chaos. And when a human has that epiphany, they can either come to believe in God or reject God. But what Thomas Aquinas is saying is that the existence of God is not self-evident, like, boom, you believe in God right away. It takes looking at the evidence and then saying, yeah, there is a God. And Thomas Aquinas teaches, I think it follows the biblical contours, but it also conforms perfectly to our experience in this world. People weigh the evidence and they either believe in God or they don't believe in God. It's not something self-evident like two plus two equals four. Thomas Aquinas says it is evident and there's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that that there's no evidence for God. Of course not. He's just saying it's not self-evident. Okay, so with all that being said, let's look at Margie's um, comments and questions. So Margie goes on to say this, quote, If we are not hardwired per se to believe in God, can someone debate why unbelievers, very small children, the mentally challenged toddlers— and all those who have never had the blessings of a religious experience or Bible raise their head up during a crisis, their soul in silent prayer. Or a toddler who immediately recognizes Jesus from a picture. Though the child has never been taught who that person is, the same experiment was performed on severely mentally challenged children, and they too recognize Christ. My suggestion is it is self-evident that we are very familiar with God, our soul knows him immediately. Or, sorry, she's, our soul knows him intimately. As we grow and are corrupted by the world, that is where we choose to reject God with minimal effort for worldly things. End quote. Okay, Margie, thanks so much for that, and I love your your closing conclusion there. And I want, I'm going to come back to that at the end of this. But so Margie has some good points here. You know, she says, "Look, you know, I hear you. We're not hardwired." believing in God, but why is it that small children and mentally handicapped children and maybe people who were raised in atheistic homes, why is it like when crises happen, hard times happen, they pray, they acknowledge a God? How can this be the case if God's existence is not self-evident? Well, I think we can go back to St. Thomas Aquinas here and what he says in the Summa, and we can see that small children— can and do recognize the existence of God and can and do recognize that God can help them through prayer and even mentally challenged children and mentally challenged adults. But that doesn't come into conflict or contradiction 
with what Thomas Aquinas says and St. Paul says in Romans 1, that their belief comes from a conclusion and is not self-evident. If a child were raised in an atheistic home, that child could very well grow up to be 15 years old and perhaps never contemplate that God exists. It could happen. But eventually, as a human person comes in contact with creation, the question comes up, where did this come from? And that elicits, the key word here is elicits, whether or not there is a belief in God or not. Note children, and our experience shows this. I'm a father. I have seven. I'm about to have our eighth child. I have experienced as well. Children do not come into the world believing in God and believing in Jesus Christ. We have to teach them. Even when they're baptized, we have to teach them. And by the way, the Council of Trent teaches that when a child is baptized, the child is infused, poured in, is infused with faith in Christ. So a baptized baby does have a belief in Jesus Christ. It's not their personal belief in Christ. It's infused into them through the habit of grace. But they do have faith. The babies are, quote, believers. But even they, as they grow older, need to be taught. This is why we have catechism. Wouldn't it be wonderful if children came into the world pre-programmed believing in God and believing in Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that be—we wouldn't have to have youth groups. We wouldn't have to have uh, CCD. We wouldn't have to have First Communion classes or anything like that. We'd just be like, wow, this is great. We just need to keep them from being corrupted with what they were born with. No, that's not what we experience. What we see is kids need to be catechized. They need to be taught that God exists. They need to be taught who Jesus is. Margie also brings up this idea um, about pictures of Jesus. And I've noticed this myself with kids. Kids can recognize Jesus in pictures, even if you don't even prompt them or ask them, like, you know, they'll say, oh, look, Jesus. But kids aren't always accurate on this as well. As a parent of many children, sometimes they'll see a guy who's kind of like a hippie looking guy. He's got a beard and he's thin and handsome and he's got long hair. And they'll say, Daddy, look, Jesus. <laughs> well, it's not Jesus. They made a mistake. So some of these things are not self-evident. Children do make mistakes, um, and children can be deceived, and that's why we have to be very vigilant as teachers and parents and nuns and priests and neighbors and aunts and uncles and grandparents to make sure that our children are taught the doctrines of the church, are taught to believe, and are catechized properly so they don't believe in heresy because little children can also be taught heresy when we experience this as well if you're a child and your entire life you are taught let's say you're born in a muslim nation you're taught jesus is not god you're going to grow up with that false belief unless a missionary gets to you or unless you find a copy of the christian scriptures or you find a website or something like that but it's not self-evident and that's the point here now Margie has a good point here, and I like what she says at the very beginning of her second paragraph here. You know, she says, okay, we're not hardwired to believe in God, but she does suggest, and I do want to affirm this, we are hardwired to have the faculty to believe in God. God, When God makes us humans in our souls, in our bodies, he does make us so that we will believe and trust in him. So our our hardware, you could even say our software even, is built for trust in God. It almost demands belief in God, but it doesn't come with the belief in God. And that's the distinction. So it's kind of like buying a new computer and the computer comes with no software, but the computer was built so that it can run Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. It just didn't come with Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. So the computer is built for it. It even has a keyboard for it. You know, it has a mouse. Everything is there ready for that software to work. The software just needs to be added to the hardware. So 
we're not saying here that humans are conceived and created so that they don't believe in God. It's actually the opposite. They are created so that they will believe in God, but that belief is not implanted in them innately or by nature. It is something that comes later through the investigation of evidence. So I think that's I think that's really helpful, and I think it lines up perfectly with our experience of the world. And of course, St. Thomas Aquinas, he nails it. If you want to read him in his own words, I would encourage you to go to Summa Theologiae, first part, question two, so it's the second question in the entire Summa, article one. And he writes there, is the proposition, quote, God exists, self-evident? And he says, on the contrary, no one can mentally admit the opposite of what is self-evident, as the philosopher Aristotle states concerning the first principles of demonstration. But the opposite of the proposition God is can be mentally admitted. For example, in Psalm 52, it says, The fool says in the heart there is no God. Therefore, according to Thomas Aquinas, that God exists is not self-evident. So he even says the very existence of atheists in history on planet Earth shows that the the teaching God exists is not self-evident. And this is why we must be vigilant as Catholics to teach the world that God does exist and that Christ exists and that Christ is the Son of God and that he loves us and he came down to save us and to bring us the grace of God through the seven sacraments as the instruments of God's love and of God's mercy. So there it is. I want to thank you, Margie, so much for that comment. Oh, I forgot. I was going to come back to the very end. Let's do that right now. Um, Margie says... Uh, at the very end, our soul knows him intimately. As we grow and are corrupted by the world, that is when we choose to reject God with minimal effort for worldly things. And Margie, you are so right on this. We all know from our own lives and from observing children that children believe easily. They don't need as much evidence as we adults need, but also children are more innocent and they are not distracted as much as we are by material objects. They're much more, I think, focused on relationships than they are objects. Of course, we see kids fighting over Legos and and getting upset and fighting over toys. I, I know. I have kids. Trust me. see it every day. But as we get older, we get corrupted by the world. We get corrupted by the desire for power, for money, for sex, for influence, we become prideful, we begin to compare ourselves to other people and to see where we stack up in the status sphere. And so we reject God. We move away from God. And I think children, as, as Christ said, he took the child and he put him in the midst of all the people and says, unless you become like a little one, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we must become little. We must become trusting. And we need to realize as adults, we can be corrupted by the world, as Margie says, and we can more easily reject God than a child. I have no doubt that baptized children who are the age 7, 8, 9, 10, they're not really able to commit mortal sins. They're not able to reject God in the way that a 35-year-old man or a 50-year-old woman can reject God. Because for us that are older, we are willing to, to compromise our belief in God and our love for God for things that our passions long for, whether they be abortion or stealing money, whatever it is, this is what adults do. So it's a reminder to all of us that although the existence of God is not self-evident to an adult or to a baby or to a seven-year-old, we do have a pattern of innocence and trust when we look at the little ones. When we look at children, even when we looked at those who are mentally challenged, and we should honor that and we should respect it as Christians, especially as Catholics. Well, I want to thank all of you for listening to this Ox Talk and for being in the New St. Thomas Institute. I've been seeing more and more people receive their certificates, and if you do get your certificate, I want you to do me a favor. Go on Facebook and take a picture of it and share it with me. Tag me in it. I want to see your certificate, and I want to personally thank you, and I want to I want everyone else to see it as well. So when you earn your certificates, go on Facebook, find me, and tag us. You can put it up on New St. Thomas Institute Facebook wall or on my Facebook wall, Dr. Taylor Marshall, 
I want to see it. I want to congratulate you. So thanks so much. Also, as I mentioned in the last Ox Talk, um, we're looking at maybe doing a conference for all of you musk oxen, um, either a conference and a pilgrimage or a pilgrimage that is a conference, um, probably to Rome in 2016. So we are just in the planning stages. So if you're interested in that, please leave a comment underneath this Ox Talk and tell me that you're interested. If you have any ideas of where it should be or what we should do, um, let me know. Always open to ideas. You guys are the musk oxen, and we're here to serve you and to equip you for the new evangelization. So let us know how we can best serve you in that. So I'll close like I always do. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless y'all. All right, there it is, a sample of the ox talk, and you heard me refer to the musk oxen. The musk ox is the mascot of the New St. Thomas Institute, so we are the mighty, mighty musk oxen. We'd love for you to join us in our theological studies. We have over 2,000 student members all over the world on six continents, and we are studying Catholic theology together. We are the largest international Catholic institute in the world, and we'd love for you to be a part of what we're doing and the charitable works that we're doing and the Catholic theology that we are discovering together. If you'd like to get the Ox Talks and get hours and hours and hours of Catholic training and videos and MP3s and resources, also we have a bunch of bonuses waiting for you, some free books, some MP3s on Josephology, the study of St. Joseph, how to pray the rosary, some lessons on the basics of logic, all kinds of resources that we all need in this time as our as our nations, as our world become more secular. Uh, please sign up. Again, this is fall enrollment. It ends next week, and uh, it will be closed. So if you want to join us, please head over to NewStThomas.com. Get those bonuses. Sign up. Start earning your certificate in Catholic theology, your certificate in Catholic apologetics, and get equipped, get salty. So thanks again for listening today, and uh, we will resume next week with our series on the Catholic Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation, and we will move on towards the beast and the great city and the great whore of Babylon. A lot of interesting things coming up next week in the Book of Revelation. So again, thanks so much for all of your prayers, your love, your support, and we'll see you next week. Bye now. This podcast was brought to you by the New St. Thomas Institute. Discover online Catholic classes and earn your certificate in Catholic theology at the New St. Thomas Institute. To register for online Catholic classes, please visit newstthomas.com. That's newstthomas.com.